down there. I lost the translation. Yeah, uh, when we look at the dark Mary, all right, so I just said a moment ago, they, they uh, presumably are actually younger surfaces than the islands. Now, if they're really younger, and if the entire moon has been exposed to the same rate of cratering due to asteroids and meteorites falling in from space, you know, if that rate of bombardment is the same over time, then the younger surfaces of the Marriott should have fewer craters, right? That's just an obvious, an obvious statement. And in fact, observations show that the Marriott do have far fewer craters than the brighter highlands. If you just look at the Marriott and the highlands using telescopes from Earth, and you count craters, again, a very popular thing to do in the pre-internet era, there the moon with the telescope and count craters. And what you find is that indeed the Marriott do have fewer craters. They have a lot less craters than the, than the brighter highlands do. In fact, they have so fewer craters in the highlands that the estimates up until the uh, around 1970 or so were that the Marriott were only about 100 million years old. And the highlands are about 4 billion years old, or, or roughly pushing the, the age of the Earth. Well, that's an incredibly huge difference in age. You know? I mean, 100 million years is a tenth of a billion years. So you're talking the, the highlands would be like 40 times older than the Marriott, according to this estimate. Uh, well, that's the best that could be done using Earth-based observations. And, and hypothesis, by the way, the hypothesis that this is based on is the idea that the bombardment was continual. Continual bombardment at the same rate of bombardment over time. Okay, because you know if you, if you somehow played with the rate of bombardment over these billions of years, then it, it's not a level playing field anymore, and you're not going to make the correct age estimate. So the, the idea that the Marriott are that young, only 100 million years, is based on the idea that the rate of bombardment was constant over the last four billion years. All right. Now the Apollo missions actually were able to bring back some rocks from the moon. Some of those rocks you can actually see in the Smithsonian, different places around the country. And remember, we talked about radioactive dating. Uh, <clears throat> we've already shown that radioactive dating shows that the age of the Earth is about 48 billion years, based on the decay of uranium-238. Okay, we covered this on the last exam, but the half-life of uranium-238 is about 48 billion years. And that means that if you start with a sample that's pure uranium-238, after four and a half billion years, that sample will have decayed into half lead, and half will still be uranium-238. Now this figure, was, it, what they're trying to show with this figure is that it's going to be half lead and half uranium-238 after four and a half billion years. But don't be misled into thinking that they're actually segregated like this. They're all mixed together, right? And if you look at the original sample four and a half billion years ago, you couldn't predict which one of the uranium-238 atoms is actually going to decay. That's completely unpredictable by humans. It's a quantum phenomenon that has an intrinsic amount of time associated with it, which is just four and a half billion years. But it's what we call a half-life, which means that in four and a half billion years, there's a 50-50 chance that a given uranium-238 atom is going to decay into lead. There's a 50% chance that it won't decay. So if you have, a, let's say, a, a trillion of these atoms in your sample, after four and a half billion years, that's one half-life, you can be sure that half of the original trillion atoms will decay to lead, but you can't say which ones are going to decay and which ones aren't. And that part's not predictable. But in the aggregate, you know that half will decay. But again, they'll all be mixed together. All right, so. This methodology was applied to the, uh, the samples of lunar rock. Now, they, the, uh, the landing missions were often near the edge of a maria so that they could explore both maria and highlands. You know, they wanted to do as much science as they could with these missions. So they, they were able to bring back samples from both regions. And what they find was somewhat surprising. Well, the part, part that's not surprising is the highlands are just about as old as they figured, about 4 billion years. But the Maria are, are, are fully three and a half billion years old. Not 100 million, but three and a half billion years old. Only about a half a billion years younger than the Highlands. So what this means is that, for one thing, uh, since the Maria are actually, actually about as old as the Highlands, the period of volcanic activity led to the expulsion of the magma that flooded the Maria and created these 
what we see is clearly must have ended maybe about 3 billion years ago. And the other very significant thing that this tells us is that the cratering rate, this rate of bombardment I was talking about, was not constant over the last 4 billion years. It was much heavy, heavier early on. And then it kind of fizzled away. It must have declined sharply right around the time that the highlands formed. And the reason I say this is because the Mary and the Highlands are really almost as old as each other, but the Mary have a lot fewer craters. So you must have seen a big decline in the cratering rate right around the time that the Mary is solidified uh, and formed, something like that. Because otherwise, you know, the Mary would have just about as many craters as the Highlands, and we don't see that. So something else was happening at the same time in the solar system, which is the decline of the cratering rate. So the leftover material from the solar system was kind of being used up. You know, you don't have the production of any new materials. So the leftover cometary material and asteroids and things like that were bombarding the planets, and that wasn't being replenished. So you're basically you know, running out of material. Now, we didn't know anything about the time scale for this until we made these, these types of observations. Now, if we look at the uh, diagram of the moon, so we see these different area, area, Tranquility tranquility yeah. Very tranquil. And that actually is interesting. That's also known as the Sea of Tranquility in English. How many people have ever heard of the Sea of Tranquility before? A couple people. That's where the first manned landings actually occurred. Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility. Now, they landed pretty much always in the Maria because the Maria were smoother. Remember, I mean, even if they're three and a half billion years old, there's no debating the fact that they have fewer craters. And so if you're going to land a spacecraft on the moon and it's never been done before, you're not going to land in the most rocky, you know, mountainous area you can find. You're going to land in the smoothest area that you can find. So it's always going to be a Maria early on in this, this type of mission. So uh, again, we see Sea of Tranquility. They actually were going to land in the Sea of Fertility, but they were, they were, these bombs were projected that at the center of that time, Sea of Fertility was too suggestive. So they went with Sea of Tranquility there. Sea of Vapors, again, this is the 60s, the drug connotation, they ruled that one out. Um, and actually, you can see a uh, listing here of some of the different missions. If we look at the Sea of Tranquility there, we see, for example, let's see, a bunch of different missions. The Luna missions were unmanned missions, which actually landed on the moon in advance of the Apollo mission because they wanted to try to you know, understand as much as they could about lunar geology and how to land on the moon. But you do see that 11 right there. That's, that 11 is one of the most significant 11s in human history. Has anybody ever seen the spinal tap? Oh, this is spinal tap, right? Well, they, they, they get into 11 too. You know, this guy's 11, the whole thing, too. are into that. But this is an even more significant 11 than the 11 in that particular book. Just saying, because this is the 11 that stands for Apollo 11. If we look up here, the very first um, man in landing. And that, um, there's actually an interesting story about that that I didn't know about until I visited Cape Canaveral in Florida a few years ago. But when the landing was actually taking place, it was supposed to occur by computer control. And Neil Armstrong is the pilot of the lunar module. And I showed you what the lunar module looks like. It's this weird looking, spidery looking thing, but it's a big descent engine that's supposed to fire the retro and allow it to land on the moon. Remember, no parachutes or anything like that, no atmosphere, right? So he's flying in, uh, the computer's controlling it, and, and Neil looks down and sees boulders and small craters all over the place that they never know, just never noticed before. So he has to actually abort the computer control. It's kind of the ultimate test pilot moment. You know, he has to override the computer, and he grabs the joystick manually, and now NASA's monitoring all this by radio, and they see he overrode the computer, but they don't, they don't know what's going on, and they're asking Neil, what, what are you doing, basically? What's going on there? And he can't talk, and he's too busy manually flying this thing, the ultimate you know, video game. And so he finds a clear spot, and he lands it with 30 seconds, and this is really good, 30 seconds left of fuel in the main retro. So the you know, nerves of steel, it's just an understatement for this guy. He actually just passed away with it about two months ago. And so they were all holding their breath in, uh, in uh, mission control on the Earth. And you know, I said, a lot of guys are trying to move down here when he finally made the announcement that the Eagle had landed. That was a big, big announcement that they actually landed because they didn't know what the heck was going on 
for that period of time when he overrode the computer and did the landing but pulled that off. So that's pretty legendary. And this is just a nice, pretty typical scene of the moon. If you ever find yourself there, it's going to look a lot like this. Uh, pretty much strewn with debris. Uh, you notice no human footprints because this was pre, you know, any exploration activity. But it's covered by this uh, regolith, which is a very fine, like a talcum-like powder, which is the result of repeated pulverization by impact over and over again. And in fact, small craters can even get obliterated by this kind of pulverization that occurs. So you do actually have erosion on the moon, but it's the result of being pounded by large asteroids, which can obliterate uh, small craters. This really doesn't happen on the Earth as much because our atmosphere protects us. So we have wind and water erosion on Earth, but you actually get erosion by direct, incredibly violent impact on the moon there. And this is actually a like a little line of designer spacesuits that NASA was working on at one time. They were working on a special Michael Phelps model. It was supposed to be uh, ab, ab friendly, as we say. Um, anyway, again, it's a random thing that managed to survive in my PowerPoint. All right, so if we look at the moon over time, if we go back around 4 billion years ago, we're seeing the formation of the highlands. Now, just as the Earth was completely molten, the Moon was completely molten at this time until it cools enough to actually solidify a, a silicon-rich surface, much like the surface of the Earth at that time, although obviously we have no atmosphere. So this is basically the initial solidification that leads to the, the Terra, the highlands. And around three billion years ago, this is after the volcanic activity has occurred, the Maria has been flooded. This is the near side because the flooding of the Maria tended to occur on the side facing the Earth, mainly due to the tidal effect. So we see the Maria forming. And then what's really happening from uh, three billion years ago to today is just a, a lot more cratering. You know, not really much has happened geologically on the Moon since three billion years ago. But when you see the change in the pattern, it's really due to this obliteration I was talking about. It's this, it's this erosion by uh, mass impact that's occurred for that, that period of time. 